greetings everyone who are and shalom to you in Jesus mighty name uh, my name is Barry uh, I'm 53 this year uh, the reason why I'm sharing today is because uh, if you want to hear those good things about me uh, you will be disappointed because why there is nothing good about me but if you are he hearing today about the goodness of God that what Christ has uh, did or done in my life then uh, even the book in the Bible that mentions the goodness of God there, there are too many to names even the book or even the Bible or the book in the world cannot contain uh, living in for 53 years of my life uh, I have spent two-thirds of my life uh, behind bars which means that I've served uh, more than 28 years behind bars at the age of nine I came by the way I came from a broken family at the age of nine or ten uh, both of my parents divorced and that has greatly uh, affected me uh, because during that time I do not know how to express so I bottled it up everything to myself so I kept it to myself and I, I began to blame myself uh, for my parents' divorce. And that greatly affected me. So at the age of nine onwards, then I began to kind of like uh, lose loss interest in studies. And at the age of 12, I began to... Uh, I, I stopped studying after my PSLE because I've lost interest and because I'm also... Uh, introvert so everything I kept in myself to myself then I also start to blame myself I became self-condemned and that kind of uh, feelings or have resulted in 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 the bondage of self-condemnations that everything that happens in my life I thought it was me because nothing good is was in me then nothing good will happen to me and that resulted to uh, being isolated, my being isolated to myself. So I, I kept everything to myself until the age of twelve. I began to uh, join gangs. Then I, I began when after joining gangs, uh, I was introduced to substance abuse. So I began to took took up uh, glue sniffing. So at the age of almost twelve to thirteen. I took up glue sniffing and I have sniffed glue for many, many years and have been arrested for many times. Uh, in record, I was arrested for 13 times, but off record, uh, I can't remember because I was a juvenile. So those, the police arrested me, they kind of let me go. But that doesn't stop uh, my habit. And and because I began to join gangs, the reason I joined gangs because I felt that uh, uh, I, I want to be, I felt being accepted. I felt that, that the, my gang members can relate or resonate with the same feeling that I have before. So trying to put on an upfront of being or acting tough to prove, you know, everything was okay, but deep within me, I everything was not okay. I was living in self, not only self-condemnation, I'm living in, in uh, stress, I'm living in in, in, in in fact sadness. So at the age of uh, 13 to 14, at the age of 13, I, I committed my first crime, uh, which is a housebreaking. And during that time, uh, I always played Tron in school. I left my school at uh, at the age of 13, so uh, I played Tron. I do not uh, have the interest to go to school. And what happened was, I, I always I ran away from home to the extent that my mom cannot control me, that she has to apply the, uh, to the court uh, beyond parental control. And that's when I was sent for, uh, to attend court. I was summoned to attend court and was placed under two years of probation. And during the, 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 after the court hearing that I was placed two years of probation, the first night that I came, first day that I came back from court, 
I already absconded my probation because I was so rebellious. And because I also want to ease my so-called uh, pain or sorrows through uh, substance abuse. So during that, that, the period of abscond, I, I also get to introduce by my friend to, to, uh, to, buy, to introduce by, by my friend to take up uh, cannabis. And from cannabis, I elevated to heroin, which was highly addictive, which I do not know about uh, the, the, the impact of uh, or consequences of uh, this heroin. And at the, during that period, all the while I'm still absconding and running away from home until I got arrested at the age of 15. So I was sent to uh, Singapore Boys Home under remand. And again, but because uh, my probation officers recommended that I should be placed under uh, RTC Reformative Centre, which should be housed for, the, uh, which housed those youth. But because of my age and because of my habits, my substance abuse habit, uh, I was rejected. So again, my probation got extended again, uh, for another year. And same thing, after, after the court hearing, I, I, the day I came back, I absconded again. And this time, and when I absconded, I be, my, my, my life went actually spiral. Then what happened was that uh, at the age of 16, I got arrested, which, is, which was on my birthday, I remember. Then I was sent to uh, Re Queenstown Remand Prison for the adults, which housed all those uh, criminals or crime with, with all types. So after my remand, again, because of uh, when I, th during that time I was a uh, youth, but the court was lenient and gave me another year of uh, extension of probation. Same, same thing, on the same day I came back, a while later I absconded again. And this resulted uh, in the a process of a cycle, a, the cycle of uh, being bondage in drug, uh, the cycle of being rebellious, to the authority, uh, to my, pa my parents, and also uh, rebellious to the people around me. But during that time, why I felt like that way? Because I, I felt that as, as in my mentality was such that as, you know, if I were to commit the crime or I pay, I pay for the consequences, I face the music. So that was my thought before, and it was a very self-centered thought. But during that period of in and out of uh, uh, prison or absconding, all the while I'm, I was living in fear, which, and, and fear of loneliness, also living in fear of getting arrested, and of there are, there are many fears in my life that, that has crippled me to move on, even to think uh, properly. So after my remand prison, which I got a uh, one-year extension, then I, I absconded again. At the age of 17, I, I was arrested again. But this time, because of my urine positive, I was sent to uh, Singapore, uh, what you call it? DRC, all right? Drug Rehabilitation Center, as a first-timer at the age of 11, 17. Uh, as a first timer, when I get in into the drug rehab, it was like uh, an adventurous moment for me because something new to explore. Then that's where I get to, instead of uh, being rehabilitated, all right, I became, I learned all those smart street smart tricks, the kind of thinking of how to uh, how to avoid being caught, how to possess drugs or how to consume even uh, hardcore drugs. So that was my life. So after I served my one year in DRC, when I came out, not long after, I absconded. And when, uh, I, 
when I was absconded, so when <clears throat> during that period, I am supposed to uh, report for my NS enlistment. And by the grace of God, during that day, when I went for reporting with a record of being wanted, I, I still went for it. And true enough, when I went for the reporting, I was called aside. Then the police came and they, they sent me in. So, and what happened was that after that, I was sent to, uh, because of my enlistment, so they gave me the opportunity to go in NS. So when I went into NS, the habit didn't stop. After my three months of uh, basic training, then I was posted to a unit. But in, during that period, I was still on substance. I was still uh, on glue sniffing. So I was arrested for the first time for detention barrack. Then after my detention barrack, I again I came out not long after I I got uh, arrested again for assault uh, my uh, army officers then uh, with also urine positive of uh, uh, glue sniffing then after that I served my uh, six months and after my six months I came out again not long after my urine positive again then get arrested again for drug consumption and was sentenced by the court martial for 24 months which is the maximum during my time so after the 24 months I, I served my 24 months I came out within few months I absconded then was arrested again then my third my, uh, uh, once again went in to serve my detention barrack but instead the army discharged me with uh, this dishonorable discharge and because the army don't want me so I was sentenced to prison uh, three years for the first time so when I step into prison instead of rehabilitating and, or being changed uh, my network grew all right my network expanded see but all this period uh, when I look at back during that period of uh, absconding during I always wanted to to change but the the spirit is willing but the flesh is indeed very weak so every time when i came out uh, because of my gang activities because of my my self bond that, that self condemnation bondage so every time that i want to i wanted to change but i i can't find it the strength but while i'm was inside i'm sober i can think clearly but what happened when I came out, just like there's a saying that goes, you, you will, once the pain is over, you forget the pain. So what happened was when, when during all this while, living in bondage, living in fear, there were many countless times that I, I actually resigned to life. So I, so I resort to self-pity, I resort to uh, react, rebelliously against the authority, against pe to people around me. So I kind of hurt many people in my life. And as I remember when I came out of prison, every time my, my, my so-called freedom doesn't last. So I came out from prison within the, the maximum is almost two years, I'll go back again until the extent that every time when I went in, my mother will come and visit, my, my, my father will come and visit. So er, from one prison, from one police station to one prison, another prison, is, I, I'll bring them all around. It's, that was my, my, my youth, my childhood then. Until the extent that uh, because of many teens breaching against or breaching the... the, the the, the, the drugs or bridging the, the law of, of Singapore until the extent my family has to give up on me. Because every time I came out, come out of prison, instead of celebrating, there's this fear. The fear for my, from my mother was that instead of celebrating my release, she will worry, she will concern that when will I go back again? So, 
after so many uh, failures and disappointments that I have caused to them in my life, to the loved one that I've, I've caused to them, what happened was that uh, I, I have no one to turn to, even despite that there are people who wanted to help me, but I chose not to. Because I chose not to, firstly, because I, I felt that I, I, I'm not good enough. There's nothing good in me that these people, they, why they, will they want to help me? Which I find that it doesn't make sense at all. Then, to fast forward again a bit, uh, my last teen with the law was 2008. And by the way, my last sentence was 10 years, uh, 12 strokes of cane for two counts of armed robbery and uh, third consumption of, uh, of drugs, which is the long-term treatment. So under the long-term treatment, minimum sentence is seven years, six strokes. Two counts of robbery, armed robbery, its minimum is three years, six strokes to 12 strokes. So I remember the day on 2008 when I was arrested. Uh, when I, I was placed into a hot, uh, a, a lockup by myself. It was Bedok Police Station, a lockup by myself. So when I was placed in a lockup, so for the first time in my life, I actually knelt down and I pray. And what did I pray? I pr instead of praying for life, I actually pray for death because I was tired. Because I was not only tired by, of myself, I'm, I was tired of the prison cycle, the, the cycle that I have to go through again and again. And then what happened was, after, uh, during that time when the IO, investigations officer, took my statement, I asked him, so, uh, what will my sentence be for this time? So my IO told me, uh, Barry, prepare yourself for minimum of, minimum of 10 years. 24 strokes of cane. And when I heard that, again, fear crept in me. But and on the other hand, I felt that, oh, how am I going to face that, that kind, this, the, the, the sentence ahead of me? I remember on that night after my statement, I told my I.O. that I had, I, I'm going through a withdrawal symptoms and requested for a medical checkup. And they sent me to, uh, because of me under uh, police custody, so they sent me to Changi Prison Hospital. I remember I went to the hospital in morning, 12.30, when I reached there, waited for the doctors to come for the checkup. And after everything, I was admitted. And I remember it was 2.30 in the morning. While walking towards the passage to that same passage was the passage that all gallows inmates will go through for their medical uh, appointment or medical checkup. So during that night, it was me and just the warden. And when I walked through that passage, I felt myself like I'm walking through the passage of death. The passage that I... I just like the passage of hell, you know, I'm going in. And I remember when I stepped into the step into the ward, I saw a person just next to me. At my right hand side, I saw him. That that gentleman actually was. Uh, I, I saw him. The hand crunch and the leg actually shrink, and the eyes half open with many tubes and pillows and all around him. So I was stunned, right? And what happened was when I went to my bed. My, my friend next to my bed told me that this gentleman actually committed suicide. And very sad was that because the hospital, the doctors prescribed an immediate release. Why he committed, and due to his, because we committed suicide and due to the lack of oxygen, he became vegetated for life. So when I heard of that, uh, it, what adds on to the impact was when the, my friend told me the doctor actually prescribed immediate release. Uh, true enough, both, parents, both of his parents came. But on the other hand, very sad because 
both of his parents didn't took him back. Because if they were to took him back, they need at least $4,000 a month just to engage someone to attend to him. And that's why they didn't took him back. So when I learned about this, his condition, I kind of sensed that at least I look at the gentleman, he don't stand a chance to walk out of prison. But as for me, regardless of how harsh my sentence may be, I still stand a chance to walk out of prison. So that, that gave me a sense of hope and a sense of comfort. And then the following day when I went, uh, when I was uh, on my way to the, the toilet for my morning ablutions, my, someone called me up. So it was my friend. So when he called me, hey, Barry. So when I turned my head and saw him, uh, he asked me, hey, what, was, what happened to me? So when, when I re replied him in uh, actually a, a very boastful tone, telling my friend, hey, this time is going to be, it's going to be very severe or harsh punishment for me, for me because my I.O. told me, get ready for minimum 10 years and 24 strokes. So I actually replied him in a very boastful tone. But when it was my turn to ask my friend, what happened to you? That his reply actually gave, bring, bring me to the ground that I, I really lost of words to comfort him. This was his reply. When I asked him, what happened to you? His, the reply from him was, I don't stand a chance to walk out of prison anymore. And when he replied that, instantly I know what was his offence. Okay? He, he actually uh, trafficked drug above the uh, required amount or standard amount, which uh, amounted to for hang. So, true enough, nine and a half years later, he got hanged. He got hung. So when the, after when he told me about his condition, I just kind of lost my word. And I went back to my, uh, to my bed. I kind of ponder again. And I, I still, when I look at him, I sense a, a, a sense of hope in myself. In a sense, because when I look at him, he told me he has no chance to walk out of prison while I still do. So that was the word that actually anchored and brought me to the ground to see life in a very different perspective. And these are also one of the two cases only and because it was a terminal illness ward. So after I, three days after I, my uh, treatment, I got discharged and God is good. After my discharge, I was bring, brought back to the same cell again. So when, I, when, when the officers left, and placed me in the cell and when they left, immediately I knelt down and prayed. But this time, instead of praying for death, I actually pray for life because I see life, hope in living. So, I actually cried with tears and I actually cut my hand. I told God, if you give me this breath, you know, where you show me people that what, what death is all about, and then I can start to feel that the breath that you've given me, then let it be a breath that returns to you in praises and in glory. So that was my prayer. Then, true enough, I got sentenced to 10 years, 12 strokes of Cain. And what happened was, I, after that, uh, that cycle of going through court procedure and uh, caning, I, I began to serve my terms. And when I began to serve my terms, it was not an easy uh, journey because I remember when I was active in gangs, all my friends who, who wanted to change, if they are in my room, you know, I will chase them out. But this time for myself, when I wanted to change, I got the same treatment from my so-called gang members. So this is a, a very painful lesson, but it's a lesson worthwhile because that was a time I tell myself that I do not 
uh, want to be involved in gangs. I renounced my gangs when I was inside and I began to walk the other way that never have I thought possible. And I began to, to seek God in, during my incarceration time. I began to read the Bible. I read a lot of uh, books, scriptural books, that, that really opened my eyes to see who God really is. So I began to learn who wanted to, to learn more about God and how this God who can change, can change life, can, can impact lives. I want that God to change me because in my life, I'm, I have come to realize that there were countless times that I have actually abused the life that have, or the breath that God has given me. Because like, for example, right now, uh, the air we breathe is free. But if during this COVID-19, if you were to get infected by the disease, the respiratory that pumps air into your lungs, you need to pay. Sorry. So during that my time, so I realized that every time, you know, all this while in my life, I have been abusing or taking the breath that God has given me for granted. Then I, when I served my sentence, what happened was that it was it, it was never an easy, because I remember before I went into prison, there were countless times I actually climb climb up the window, actually wanted to jump down, but every time I I actually step back and came, climb back down in defeat and with in tears. The reason why I was in tears is not because of uh, disappointment. It was because it's not because I do not have the guts to die. It's because I do not have the guts to live. That's why I felt so disappointed with myself that I have no guts to live. Then. Inside prison, uh, when I began to seek God, I see or experience new things. I experience the love of God, that His love, the love of God that really, really uh, is beyond description. All right. So uh, this is me. Okay. Uh, and the reason why I I want to show this this photo painting. It was my painting that I painted when I was outside. Okay. Uh, when I encounter this chapter, all right, in the book of uh, Luke, when I feel, all right, when I when I when I read about this prodigal son, the three losses, the first when I saw this painting, I felt that I was the lost one. But then there's a God that who 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 is willing to forsake the 99 and came for the one. So when, when, I, when I encountered this verse inside, I felt so much loved, you know, despite of all my failures, all my disappointment, all the heartaches that I've caused to people, all the fear that I have inflicted in people's lives, the pain that I've caused to people, and God never fails. He still comes for me. So that really kind of like changes me and open my eyes to see the love of God in a different perspective. So in the, in, when I was inside prison, I served my time. Then one fine day, I remember 2011, uh, the year 2011, prison has this yellow ribbon art competitions. So in, for me, during that time, I was thinking of uh, maybe participating in this uh, art competition to pass my time. Then... Uh, what happened was that my my submission got selected for uh, finals. Then I was actually during the finals I was given an award. Then after I got the award from the uh, competitions, I was sent by the prison to attend a basic art course, twenty four lessons of basic art course. So during the Basic art course, the 24 lessons, we learn, I learned ab about those basic sketching, watercolor and uh, so on and so forth, sculptures and so on and so forth. But then I, there's one uh, instance that I, 
I think it's worth mention that because it gives me a strong conviction. It was my first watercolor assignment was given by my art teacher, our art lecturer. So after I painted that, that painting uh, to, for my assignment, my art mentor or teacher actually came and told me I, I want to buy this painting. So to me, it was a very great encouragement. It gives me a strong conviction uh, to, to really see on my art journey. But it really puzzled me also because he is, he is a still life painter. He teaches in Nafa, but yet he wants to buy my painting. So I went to ask him, what's the reason why you want to buy my painting? So he told me, uh, I'm not sure, but I, I do not know how to explain, but I see something in in you. By the way, he's also a Christian. So he says he sees something in me. So after that, I, that gave me a conviction of I want to become an artist. So as after I, my, my basic art les lessons, I got selected to be a full-time, doing full-time art inside prison. So while doing full-time art inside prison, I, I began as an artist because we Inside prison are all four walls. So what I paint is all about landscape, about animals and all. all the, these are all the subjects. But as I paint all these subjects, I begin to see creations. I begin to see, uh, to, or to hear that actually creations is the voice of God. So as I continue my art journey, then I got to... Real, I get to realize that my art journey, I always challenge myself, by the way. I challenge myself and ask, does art really carry a purpose? Or is just art be is solely just because of aesthetic value? Then I came to realize, you know, when during the process of creations, I began to, or, or process of creating, I began to see things in a very different perspective. God showed me that, you know, art does carry a purpose. Then God shows me that, in fact, everyone is an artist. So I, I kind of ask myself, everyone is an artist. Yes, if as long as you create something out of nothing, you are actually an artist. So from that, that enlightenment or that, that picture I saw, I came to realize that I actually broke down and cried, you know. I cried because why instead of creating, actually I have been destroying all the while. I have destroyed my, my life, my health, my, the, the trust that people gave. I destroyed literally almost everything. So from that, through that experience or encounter, I, re I tell myself that I will not want to destroy but to create. So as I continue my art journey, I remember uh, almost two, two and a half years before my release, one day I had a dream. So I dreamt of myself holding a brush, all right, holding a, my, a brush. Then the tagline was from strange to brush. So I saw the picture of myself appearing on newspaper. Then when I woke up, I went to tell my, my roommates and the first thing when I told my roommates, everyone laughed at me because why? Because firstly, they know that I have no family visit. My family gave up on me. They know that I have no saving. They know that uh, I, I do not have uh, academic credentials. They, they know that I don't even have a shelter, a home or a roof over my head. So they were laughing. They says, yeah, it's good to have dream, but don't daydream. So... But that kind of uh, <laughs> discouraged me. But when I went to talk to my, uh, to tell my my uh, mentor, my art mentor, he was the first one in my life throughout my the whole life or course of my life. He was especially in prison setting. He was the to first one who told me, "Yeah, good. God gives you a dream, then be serious with that dream." And God, when God gives you a dream, God will bring the dream to pass. Keep that dream alive. So through uh, for the following days, I went to uh, tell my spiritual mentor, 
So I went to, I went to tell him that I, I had this dream. So again, he was the second person who confirmed. He told me that, yes, God also gave Joseph dreams in the Bible. And if, can, if God gave Joseph dream in the Bible, God bring dreams to pass. And he confirmed it by saying, keep that dream alive. So hands on, henceforth, I kept that dream alive despite there were many struggles in my mind. My struggles in, because why? The struggles of, uh, between the reality and the uncertainty. The, uh, the reality is I don't have savings. I do not have uh, qualifications. I do, I'm not LaSalle, nor NAFA trained. I, I don't have shelters and because of my past. So this is the reality. This is reality. But the uncertainty is when God says He gives me a dream, He will bring the dream to pass. So there's this, always these struggles between myself. Where, where should I place my focus in? Focus in reality or focus in my dream? If I focus in reality, Reality, I'll be like Peter walking on water. When he looked at the storms, he sank immediately. But when I look at the uncertainty, the uncertainty which what God has said in His words. So the only every time when I have all these confusions, I will go back to what God says because I want to challenge and I want to get the answers. So I do not have a very strong faith or very, I will not say very strong faith or I'm very spiritual, but as I only have primary six qualifications. So when I read the Bible, I read it in simple faith. I read it as the Bible says, I only, I, I only need a master seat faith. So what is master seat faith to me? It was not an easy task because the uncertainty always brings me, uh, gives me a challenge to whether to believe the reality that what's happening in my life or what's ha what has happened in my life or the uncertainty that what God says became certain. So, when I pain, I get my answers through art. So, how do I get the answers? So, when I paint landscape, I begin to paint the birds. I always look at what the Bible says, look at the birds. So I always, in my prayer, in, in, in the midst of confusion, in the midst of fear, in the midst of struggle, I will always look at what the Bible says, look at the birds. If God, I tell God, if you, if you can feed, if you can feed the birds in the air, you can feed me. You will bring me out towards the Red Sea, you will never leave me alone there. So, but in, true enough, the word keep assuring me, keep uh promising me that He will never leave nor forsake me. So these are the words that I hold on to. And true enough, five days later after my release, yeah, after my release, my mentor, my spiritual mentor actually came and fetched me. He picked me up on, on my day of release. So I, because I do not have a shelter, so I was, I rented a place uh, at Yishun. So I, with the, just now I mentioned I do not have saving, but I thank God I do have some saving by the grace of the government. I, I managed to save two thousand over dollars from the GST funds and all the I had the vouchers. So I managed to save the two thousand plus. But with the two thousand plus, I need to pay my rental. I need to pay my my basic essentials. I need to pay my deposit. So I left not much. So during that time, how to how to keep my dream alive? But I still carry on because when I share with my mentor, my mentor also believed in this dream. So five days later, I took up the brush. I went to Upshot, we bought some uh, art stuff, and I took up the brush, I started painting. But very sad, I've, I inside prison, I have painted five, six hundred over commission work. But when I came out, I faced a canvas for two days. I do not know what to paint because I really lost why again the reality kicks in and challenge against the uncertainty the reality is how can i compete with there are all the renowned artists or how can i uh, sustain in in doing doing art so uh, that was my 
my, my struggles then. But then, again, the uncertainty tells me, yes, God says, look at the birds. God says that if He has placed dream in me, He will not leave me nor forsake me. So that was my, my the, the, the answers that I, I have to look on to. So all that, that, the promise that I have to cling on. Then I continue to practice my art five days. During that, after, uh, when I pray, after the, that facing the blank canvas for two days, then I, get, I, I surrender, I commit to, go, to God in prayer. I say that, if, God, if you bring me thus far, you place the canvas to, in, before me, right? Holy Spirit, you are my teacher, you are my comforter. You teach me what to paint. So instead of painting what I wanted to paint, then I start to see painting pictures of my life, flash, flashes of my life. So I started to paint uh, the starfish story. So when I start painting, the story goes this like this. All right, one fine day, this young boy uh, went to the beach and saw thousands and thousands of starfish was washed ashore. So he took up one by one and he started throwing back to the sea. And then there was an old man that follows him and saw what the boy was doing. So he... He stopped the boy and asked and told the boy that does it really matter as there are many to save? So that, that the boy actually paused and turned back to the old man and told the old man, yes, it may not matter to you, but it does matter to that one starfish. So that was the starfish story that I painted because I saw myself as the, the starfish has been washed ashore, but there are actually people that have, God has sent into my life, all right? To, to pick me up and throw me back. But there was many times, there were many times I was washed back ashore, but then there were people that God has sent who actually throw me back again. So that caused the man, old man thinking that, does it really matter? Then when he went back, he came back. He came back and do likewise. So that was the, the, uh, the anchor of why I'm doing art. And the reason why I'm doing art is because I no longer want to destroy but to create. So when I painted, that that painting took me around uh, more than a month. Then one fine day, through uh, someone's link, the, which linked me to the newspaper, then the straight time came. So when the straight time, the chief editor came and did an interview, so the first thing he asked me was, uh, wasn't, was not about my art practice. So the first thing he asked me was, how long have I been released? So I told him, I've just released uh, one and a half months. So he laughed. He laughed not because he, he kind of, he's skeptical. He laughed and he told me that very normally straight time, we don't carry this kind of story. Because if we were to write your story, one and we write a story today, we publish it tomorrow, and one week later, you go back to prison. How am I going to answer to the public? And that was the truth. But after when he saw my painting, he says, okay, let me hear your story. And when I share with him my story, uh, at the end of the session, he told me he was very encouraged. Uh, he really wants, he loves my painting, by the way. He was also my second collector of that painting. Uh, then he told me, okay, let me see what I can do. And true enough, 3.30, he left the studio. Uh, 5.45, straight time call for an appointment to, for video shoot and, and uh, <coughs> newspaper for photo shoot. So this was, this happened at July uh, 28. The newspaper actually published. And when the paper published, Something remarkable happened. Uh, okay, during that morning, it was Sunday. I remember Sunday Life, July 28, uh, 2015. So, where I was in the toilet, I came out because preparing myself to go for uh, morning church service. Uh, my phone rang, and when I asked, when I re when I answered the phone. It was an, a, a number that is very foreign to me. So when I answered the phone, I actually burst into tears. Why? Because my mother called. And when I heard my mother call, I burst into tears because there were so many things that I wanted to tell her because I have not seen her for more than 10 years. So I start 
to confess one by one. So I confess one by one all my mistakes. I start to confess and keep repeating and telling her that I'm sorry for this, I'm sorry for that, till the extent she stopped me. She said, son, stop. Now it's my turn. Listen to me. And this was what my mom says. Mom just read your article this morning. While, I'm, while mom is still living, this is the best gift you have given me. And I'm very proud of you. That was the day that marks the reconciliations with me and my mother. And after, when I, after that, I, when I was in, near the church, I remember uh, I attended a church in Pasiris that it was next to a, a, a very crowded coffee shop and a market. So when I reached the church, that, that place, I received another message. It was an a WhatsApp message. And the message... The, the WhatsApp shows that it was actually my younger brother showing me a picture of uh, my sister-in-law and his wife and his daughter was actually reading my article. So that day, instead of saying anything, I just sent emojis and uh, three crying emojis because I, I just can't withhold my tears. So that day also marks the day of my reconciliations with my brothers and um, his wife and my, my nieces. It was a very remarkable day that changes the course of my life. So when I went to church that morning, as I, as I walked in towards the church, I was all the while tearing. So people were actually looking at me as if that this holy man was actually being... So, so holy, you know, when you go to a church, you start crying. No, that was a tear instead of sorrows, but it was a tears of healing. It was a tears of joy. And that day it marks the day of uh, my, I would say, my PhD that I have received from God. Okay? The PhD was, that I received was that I am uh, pardoned, I am healed, and I am delivered that day. So I am delivered from that the spirit of self-condemnation. I'm healed from the years of brokenness and I'm, uh, I'm actually pardoned. I'm pardoned by the, the goodness, by the love of God. And then what do I do right now? Uh, remember just now I mentioned I came out with absolutely nothing. So uh, after the newspaper was published, all the orders came in right, uh, till date. Right? I still haven't completed my orders yet. So that was how God has provided me. So every time when I was looking at, when I was, I'm in a struggle, in the midst of struggle, it was actually the Word of God that I will look into. It, will, it, was, it is actually the promise of God that I will look into. What that God has promised me. He pros, promised me to look at the birds. If He can feed the birds, He can feed me. He can feed you. If he can clothe the lily of the valley, he can clothe me. So till date, till date, I have no lack, but instead I have, I have extra. I thank God for that. And this is me. Uh, this is in my studio. And I have so many paintings. Even remember the starfish painting? The first painting that I actually painted, uh, someone wanted to buy over it. There were actually many offers to, who wants to auction for it, but I did not sell it because it was my first dedication, it was my first fruit to God. And God actually multiplied. And what do I do today? Uh, I, I travel uh, around the world uh, to, to exhibit my art. I was invited to, uh, to uh, many countries to, to do street art, to use my, my art to reach out to people. Right? And I'm, I'm also with... Uh, with art, I also reach out to people who, who, are, who, who don't see hope in life. Who, that I also tell them that uh, they are also a creator. They, are also, they also have the right to create. They also have the power to create. As much as they have the right and they have the authority to create, they also have the same right and authority to destroy. So that's what I do. But art has become a channel or a medium that I do my outreach. Then, uh, this is me. 
uh, why was published in uh, many medias, lo both locally and internationally. So before I conclude, I want to end with this. If the viewer of, uh, who, are, who, who are watching, to all the viewers who are watching, I want to let you know that as long as you have hope, you have breath, you have hope. Again, as long as you have breath, you have hope. Thank you. I'd like to thank Barry for sharing his life story. As I said before, you know, I believe many of us laugh and cry all at the same time. But I believe that this is a tear of joy. Tear of joy to know the goodness of God in, a, in his life and how God has turned his life round about. And it is really possible as we cast our eye on God and trust and depend on Him, that the Lord will turn our messy life around, that we can live life anew. As Barry shared with us in Psalm 150 verse 6, he says, as long as you have breath, you have hope. As long as you have breath, you have hope. Even in your hearts and the declaration of your mouth, that you can declare the Lordship of Jesus Christ into your life and that you can say to Jesus right here and right now, wherever you are, you know, that Jesus, I believe in you. You can receive. And so really, as long as you have breath, you have hope. Now is the time of hope. Now is the time for you to receive Jesus into your life that you will find hope. Allow me to share in brief the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it is taken from John chapter 1. John chapter 1 has a lot to instruct us uh, about how can we receive Jesus into our life. John 1 verses 12 to 13. And this is what the Bible says, that but to all who receive Him, He gave them the right to become the children of God. But to all who did receive Him, He gave them the right to become children of God. And the Bible tells us that children who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of men, but of God. In other words, to them who receive Jesus into their life, that you can become the children of God. You have the legal right to become the children of God, the spiritual legal right. And the Bible says that you will be born of the will of God. In other words, that you are born again into the new spiritual birth that the Bible tells us. You know, the Bible tells us that all of us are dead in our sins. And that like Barry's story, you know that it is a clear demonstration of one dead in sin, totally helpless, totally incapable of breaking free from the clutches and the bondage of sin. Well, Barry's life no doubt tells of a, a certain extreme of, 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 of the life lived without God. But brothers and sisters and friends, you and I know that if we look into uh, the closet of our hearts, you know how messy our life can be or how messy our thought life can be, that how messy in our interpersonal relationship. You know, but the moment you just put your finger and point to the place of the lack of peace, that is a clear evidence of the presence of sin in, in our lives. You know, I just want to tell you today that the good news is that Jesus came and took the penalty of sin on Him so that by His death, that the penalty is paid. But through His life, that we may live a new life in Him and that we can be born as sons and daughters of God and that we can live a life that free from the power of sin over us. Jesus not only paid the penalty of sin, but Jesus paid, break us free from the power of sin. So that sin has no way to hold us. The Bible says we have the right to become the children of God. Sins have, have, have no way to bind our mind, you know, in the way of thinking. Perhaps it could be depression. 
Perhaps it could be a, a, a way of, of negativity that is always set into our mind. Or it could be a certain thing that is set in our mind to distrust, to fear. You know, whatever that may mean, that the Lord will bring that newness. Both in, in our mental, emotional and relational, and most of all in our relationship with Him. That we can live life anew. And there are two things that I want to share with us from, from John chapter 1. Is that in verse 3, He says, all things were made through Him. The creations are made through Him. And without Jesus was not anything made that was made. In other words, that, that, that everything was created by God. The Bible tells us there is a Creator. Uh, contrary to what science say, that, that science says everything evolved. But the truth of the matter is that God made everything. If you look at the design of the creation, look at the design of us, it is clear cut that is a designer. That everything is done in such precisions in order for life to thrive on earth. This is not a random uh, collision of two atoms that created all things. And the creator not only created life, but creator also created us to have relationship with him. The Bible tells us that we are made for relationship with Him. And that's why Jesus come, died, took our sin, so that we can re reconnect and our relationship with God can be restored once again. But there's a, there's a point that I want to make here is that verse 3 says, And without Him was not anything made that was made. Or rather, it could be read as, That which has been made was life in Him. Verses 3 and 4 allow me to bring the forward beat of the verse 4 to help us to understand that it is not the making of the creation. That's it, full stop, the, the everything. But more important, the Bible says that God made us for relationship. And, so, and, and it is to be read in this way that that which has been made was life in Him. Traditional translation tells us that in verse 4, in Him was life, and the life was the light of man. And so if you read the, the, the two verses together, we begin to understand that we are made to live life in Him. That in Jesus was the light of man. And that in Jesus, in God, we have life with Him. And so that is what I mean. That life without God it is almost as light in our house suddenly switch off. Everything in darkness. We are groping in the dark, trying to find a direction. But when we have Jesus in our life, we not only have life, but we, got, we begin to realize the light is switched on. We begin to find a life purpose and a direction. We begin to see the Creator of God who made life with Him, made life so that we can be with Him. We begin to see how our Creator God will lead and guide us in our life. And so, allow me to share with this that that, that when we have a life living relationship with Jesus, we begin to experience these few things. And the Bible tells us that not only we, be, we have the right to become the children of God, the Bible tells us that we will receive grace and truth. And now allow me to read verse 16. For from His fullness, from Jesus' fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. You know, as we receive Jesus into our life, you know, not only we have the right to become the children of God, the Bible tells us we will receive grace and truth and we will receive grace upon grace. You know, allow me to bring our attentions to verse 14. And the Word became flesh, which is Jesus who took on the flesh of man and dwelt among us, and as, as declared by the first century disciple. All right? And it says here that, we have seen His glory and the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And such was Jesus in the full demonstrations, and the disciples began to understand grace and truth. And what is grace? Grace is really the favor of God. What is truth is the opposite of life. That in the life and in the person and God, Jesus Christ, we begin to see the grace and the truth. And the Bible tells us that we who became His children is, uh, and will receive 
grace upon grace. Verse 16 says, From His fullness we all received grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. In other words, when we receive the Lord Jesus into our life, we receive the right to become the children of God, that we receive grace. Unmerited favor. Grace is that you don't have to earn anything to get the right to be loved. You don't have to earn anything to be forgiven. You have to, don't have to do anything to be accepted. Because the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is this, that Jesus loved you that Jesus died for you in the full demonstrations of His love for you in order to receive you into His life and to have a relationship with you. And some of us who, who have been um, thinking about life, thinking about what the meaning and the purpose of life, some of us who have not yet received the Lord Jesus Christ into your life, today is a time of hope. As long as you have breath, you have hope. I'd like to encourage you, wherever you are, and when you know, you know when it's time for you to receive Jesus, don't hold it there. Don't, don't shut and distance yourself, but to really open your heart right now, right here, wherever you are. You can say this prayer with you, a simple prayer to receive Jesus into your life. Allow us to just bow our head and close our eyes. In the quietness of our hearts, in the room that we are in, I want to lead you in a personal conversation with Jesus and with God. These first conversations will signal and, and start many more. When you're ready, say this prayer with me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for dying for my sin. I know I am a sinner. I believe that Jesus is the Lord and Savior. I want to receive Him into my life. I want to confess my sin and also I want to commit my life right here and right now today. I want to live a life of of, of following Jesus. I want to live a life of total freedom. I want to live a life that is anew again. Lord Jesus, come into my heart right now. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. For some of us who have received Jesus into your life, you know what? The Bible tells us that angel Re rejoice, you know, there is a resound in the heaven as well as on earth, you know. Those of us who have uh, 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 believers for a while, you know, right where you are on the YouTube, right, I want to encourage you to put a clap sound, praise the Lord, you know, hallelujah, type in hallelujah uh, in the comment sessions in the, in the YouTube chat, right? I want you to do that, you know, just as much as heaven resound, YouTube can be resound. So I'd like to encourage every one of us to do so. And those of us who have received Jesus for the first time into your life, right? I want you to just type in and say, I have received Jesus. Or you, if in a simple way or quicker way, say, I am saved. Right? I want you to type in there also, so that we as, as an online church right now, right, at a time like this, can celebrate with you and rejoice with you and, and praise the Lord together with you. Can we do that right now? Let us just take a short moment to type in, you know, praise the Lord, hallelujah, right? I am saved, I have received Jesus today, right? I just want you to just type in, yeah? Can, can you do that? Hallelujah, praise the Lord. It is exciting to see, you know, as you gave your life to Jesus as a thing of my own. You know what? Life will never be the same. Life will never be the same. In 1983, when I received Jesus into my life, in the time where life was so in so much of a despair and a discouragement, but the Lord turned my life around from a young kid and showed me that He is real. And I pray that the presence of God will meet you every day, will greet you in the morning and will meet you in the evening. And so that life will li uh, be lived differently and you may have the joy of the Lord in your life. 
You know, I'd like to encourage everyone to uh, be part of a community. Much was shared, I, and I want to encourage you to write into this email. If those of us who have not been part of a, a live group, a small group, I want to encourage you to do the same. For those of us who have received Jesus into your life, you know what? You know, we want to journey with you. We want to grow together with you. You know, so I want you to also write into the same email, right? Just share, just in brief, that I, I, I have just accepted Jesus into my life, you know? And we'd like to get in, conti, uh, conti, uh, get in touch with you and to put resources into your hand, to plug you in into the group that uh, can hold hand together with you to allow you to journey in your initial first step as Christians, as a child of God. Okay, so I want you to encourage you to do so, to write in to the same email, whether you want to be a life group or whether you have just received Jesus into your life, so that we can get in touch with you, right, in your discipleship journey. Indeed, it's such a great joy. Every name, every face, every life tell a story. You know, a story in which everyone stands together the same, sinners. But doesn't end there. Sinners saved by grace. And that because we are saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus, that we stand in the present together as brother and sisters. We are family. Petra is a, is, is a family that raises the sons and, do- sons and daughters to reflect the Father's glory. Indeed, we are family. So family, allow me to close today's service with this benediction. And I pray that as I declare the H.O. scriptural benediction, that you f- may be blessed as the Lord gave us these words. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. To the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, nobinium, and authority before all time and now and forever and ever. Amen. Be blessed. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you and your household in your coming and your going. Be blessed.